Today we're going to review the association between cannabis and psychotic illness. A truly remarkable thing has been happening, as you all know. Um, many states are declaring cannabis a legitimate medicinal agent, as well as in some cases a legitimate recreational agent. But the um, strategy of declaring it a medicinal agent is very interesting because for the first time in as long as I can remember, we have uh, a number of major governments, i.e. state governments, that are recognizing a substance as a legitimate medicine. And this medical declaration has completely circumvented the um, established FDA reviews. Undoubtedly, cannabis does have its medicinal value, um, but anything that is truly pharmacologically active comes with it the risk for, psych for adverse effects. And in the case of CNS active medications, those adverse effects would include psychiatric adverse effects. Um, notably in the marketing, if you will, or the promotion of cannabis as a medicinal agent or a recreational agent, proponents are not attending to the potential risks for psychiatric adverse effects or simply saying that any news about psychiatric adverse effects is completely overblown and should not be trusted. And for our discussion, we'll focus on the potential psychiatric adverse effect involving the creation of psychosis. The, that cannabis during acute intoxication can cause paranoia is exceptionally well known and is uh, non-debatable. What many who work with people with schizophrenia have observed is that with continued regular cannabis exposure, people appear to develop schizophrenia-like psychosis, um, at, which appears to be the, the direct consequence of the, of the cannabis exposure. And in clinical practice, it appears that that psychosis persists for a very long time, even after the cannabis has been discontinued, which leads to the concern that regular cannabis use can actually really cause schizophrenia or a schizophrenia identical condition. These clinical observations are supported by a number of epidemiological studies, which show very clearly that there is an association between regular cannabis use and later development of schizophrenia. However, there are some notable limitations to the interpretation of epidemiological data. Among the limitations of epidemiological study are confounding variables or reverse causation bias. By confounding variables, we mean that the that in this case the, the the variable of interest in this case cannabis use is not itself directly causing the outcome in this case schizophrenia, rather that the cannabis use is simply co-occurring with some other thing that actually is responsible for the creation of schizophrenia. So one confounding variable to explain or to illustrate this it would be the uh, environmental or psychological stresses. It could very well be that individuals that have high levels of environmental or psychological distress use cannabis at higher rates than non-distressed individuals, and that it is not the cannabis per se, but the stress which is causing the later life development of schizophrenia. This is a serious potential confound and is among the chief weaknesses of, of epidemiological data. Another problem or weakness of epidemiological studies is it's difficult to control for what's known as reverse causation bias. In reverse causation, uh, in this example, it would be that people who have genetic predisposition to ultimately give them schizophrenia um, happen to use cannabis at higher rates than general population, presumably because something about the schizophrenia destined to genes makes them more apt to use cannabis use earlier in life. It, it could be, for example, that um, somebody who ultimately will develop schizophrenia either has a higher level of distress and therefore uses cannabis preferentially compared to somebody who doesn't, or that someone who will ultimately develop schizophrenia will enjoy cannabis more than the average user. And the existence of these legitimate criticisms certainly gives ammunition to those who would say that cannabis is harmless with respect to psychosis causation. These dilemmas are also difficult to resolve experimentally, not only difficult, but essentially impossible, because one cannot ethically 
as well as practically um, get a very large group of individuals and randomize them to daily cannabis use for the next five years and have another group equally matched um, to smoke something other than cannabis and then wait around to see who develops psychosis. But even though we can't resolve the epidemiological limitations experimentally, at least not directly experimentally, we can certainly hold out criteria that would have to be met if cannabis were to be causal. One of those criteria would be that there would have to be a plausible mechanism or plausible mechanisms whereby cannabis exposure could cause schizophrenia-like psychosis. And another supporting piece of information would be if there is evidence of dose and response or exposure and response. In other words, um, do, do, higher, does, do individuals with higher cannabis utilization have either um, different forms of illness, more pernicious forms of illness, or do they um, experience schizophrenia-like psychosis at higher frequency uh, compared to low low-frequency cannabis users or non-users. And in the next several slides, I will show you that those criteria certainly have been met. In previous lectures in this series, we've looked at the dopamine hypothesis for schizophrenia, which states that excessive dopamine signaling can cause the symptoms of schizophrenia. And indeed, cannabis um, ingredients, particularly THC, can cause the release of dopamine, can cause excessive dopamine release from the brain. Um, and this has been shown repeatedly, so that cannabis can augment dopamine signaling certainly is in line with one of the major hypotheses of schizophrenia pathophysiology. We also discussed in previous lectures the role of glutamate signaling dysfunctions, particularly lower signal transduction efficiency at the glutamate NMDA receptor. And it turns out that cannabis, by acting on cannabinoid receptors, can affect NMDA receptor sensitivity, toning it down in ways that are reminiscent of the dysfunction seen in people with endogenous schizophrenia. And we also know that long-term exposure to, canna uh, to cannabis can uh, significantly change the density and function of the brain's cannabinoid receptors. So we have another pathway whereby cannabis exposure could impact on a neurotransmitter system with uh, strong relevance to schizophrenia. Uh, we also have seen in imaging studies that cannabis use, particularly if it starts in adolescence and occurs for the long term, can cause uh, many markers of brain maturation abnormalities, particularly in the cerebral cortex. So there are several mechanisms um, by which cannabis exposure could fit into existing hypotheses of schizophrenia. And this supports the hypothesis that chronic cannabis exposure could very well be a direct causative risk factor. Incidentally, related to the dopamine signaling hypothesis, in other words, that cannabis can strengthen dopamine signaling and thus by that mechanism cause schizophrenia-like psychosis, we have some interesting genetic studies looking at genetic variation in a gene known as catechol O methyltransferase abbreviated as COMT. COMT is involved in dopamine metabolism and COMT genetic variation exists such that some carriers of MET or methionine alleles at position number 158 will have a different enzyme activity compared to those that express valine at that, at that genetic locus. And more interestingly, it turns out that individuals that, that are um, valine homozygotes at that locus actually have extraordinarily higher risk of schizophrenia associated with adolescent onset cannabis use. In this graph, we look at on the y-axis the percentage of individuals that were studied who develop a schizophrenia, who, who receive a schizophrenia form diagnosis at age 26. Um, and on the x-axis, you see the three genotypes. On the left, the low risk genotype, which is methionine homozygote, at position 158 in COMT. Um, in the middle, you see carriers uh, or carriers, one of valine, one of methionine, heterozygotes. 
and on the right axis you see the um, valine homozygote status and in the the valine homozygotes um, there is a, uh, a very marked increase of schizophrenia schizophreniform diagnosis later in life so this study suggests that there is a genetic predisposition to cannabis associated schizophrenia psychosis later in life and the fact that it involves a, an enzyme in dopamine metabolism also is consistent with existing hypotheses of schizophrenia pathophysiology and again support the idea that cannabis exposure is a causative risk factor. Also arguing for the causality of cannabis exposure with respect to schizophrenia onset are a host of studies which show that schizophrenia diagnoses occur significantly earlier in life amongst individuals who have used cannabis. Um, again, this is indirect evidence of causation. And we also see in the last, the last bullet points um, by DeForti et al. that there seems to be a dose response or do exposure response relationship such that um, in so-called ordinary cannabis users, um, age of onset of schizophrenia is three years advanced, whereas in users of high potency cannabis, um, that earlier age of onset is advanced by, by double, by six years. So altogether a signal for cannabis as a causative factor. Meanwhile, a number of dose response studies have been done in which uh, investigators look at the frequency or the cumulative exposure to cannabis and the risk of schizophrenia later in life. And uh, these studies have been subjected to meta-analysis. And here you see a figure from a meta-analytic paper by Marconi and colleagues. Um, it shows on the x-axis the increasing dose or the increasing burden of cannabis exposure. And as that increases, or as one moves right on the cannabis exposure axis, axis then the odds ratio um, on the left axis for schizophrenia diagnosis increases. And you can see in all of these individual studies that were subjected to meta-analysis, a signal exists for increasing exposure to cannabis associating with higher and higher risk of a schizophrenia diagnosis later in life. The existence of dose response relationships is strongly supportive of the hypothesis that cannabis is directly causative of schizophrenia or schizophrenia identical condition. Not only does cannabis exposure appear to increase the risk for schizophrenia, but some studies suggest that cannabis exposure is associated with the subsequent schizophrenia being more malignant than schizophrenias that are um, occur without cannabis exposure. In this fairly large study looking at about 2000 individuals with a recently with a recent onset of a schizophrenia diagnosis, Patel and colleagues found that the cannabis using subset had more frequent hospitalizations. They were subjected to a higher, a higher frequency of involuntary treatment. And very concerningly, the cannabis using subset of the first episode psychosis cohort um, were found to have higher rates of medication switching or higher rates of antipsychotic polypharmacy. And when physicians switch medicines or combine medicines, uh, these, are usual, these, these maneuvers are usually done when the response to the first line treatment hasn't worked. So medication switching and polypharmacy are um, strongly suggestive of the, pre of the presence of a treatment resistant subtype of illness occurring more frequently amongst the cannabis using subset of individuals. To briefly summarize up to this point, epidemiologic studies show an association between cannabis exposure and a schizophrenia diagnosis later in life. Epidemiologic studies have a limitation in that other confounding variables may actually be causative and that the cannabis exposure is merely an association that is not causative. In order to address this concern, we've seen evidence that cannabis can interact in the brain 
with systems of known relevance to psychosis. And we've also seen that there is a relationship between the degree of cannabis exposure and increasing the risk of a schizophrenia diagnosis later in life. A more direct and clever way to address the issue of confounding variables is a genetic technique known as Mendelian randomization. The genes that we inherit are not influenced by environmental variables such as psychosocial stress. So if we were to look at genetic markers between people with schizophrenia and without schizophrenia, those, um, the, the, the inheritance or the prevalence of those markers it will occur um, without being influenced by other confounds. Armed with this knowledge, one can look for genes that are associated with cannabis use and set up a null hypothesis. The, the null hypothesis goes as follows. If cannabis use is indeed irrelevant to schizophrenia, then genes that associate with cannabis use should be equally shared between people with schizophrenia and without schizophrenia. Uh, roughly, this is equivalent of, of saying that if eye color has no relevance to schizophrenia, then we would see that people with blue eyes occur with the same frequency amongst those with schizophrenia as those without. So there's no schizophrenia association with eye color there because eye color is irrelevant to the disease. Um, and by, by similar logic, if cannabis is irrelevant to the disease, then there should be no preferential distribution of cannabis use genes between the two diagnostic groups. There are in fact a number of genes which are associated with cannabis use. There are about 10 that Julian Vosher and colleagues analyzed in their Mendelian randomization study to examine the association between cannabis use and schizophrenia risk. Uh, they found in fact that those cannabis use genes were not equally distributed between the schizophrenia sample and the control group sample. The conclusion therefore is that cannabis use is a causative risk factor for development of schizophrenia. Um, their odds ratio are shown in the red bars on this graph and the blue bars above that are odds ratios that have been obtained from classical epidemiologic studies. You see that not only are the Mendelian randomization data in line with um, non-genetic epidemiologic association data, um, but that the odds ratios are extremely close together. And the conclusion from the Bosch-Air study is that cannabis use during adolescence um, increases the risk of schizophrenia by about uh, 37%. So this is a kind of small yet clearly statistically significant association and does support what clinicians in the field have seen for quite a long time that a majority, for a majority of users, cannabis seems to be harmless with respect to the development of psychotic symptoms. However, there does appear to be a vulnerable subset of the population for whom cannabis exposure seems to be directly causative of schizophrenia. The implication is that if they, those individuals had not been exposed to cannabis, they would have lowered their risk of schizophrenia. So to summarize, although there is still a lot to learn about the nature of the risk, and although we could still use more data such as Mendelian randomization studies or other methods to control confounds or reverse causation bias, we do know enough at this point to be able to say with confidence that cannabis exposure is not just an associated risk factor, but is a causative risk factor for the development of, psych of schizophrenia later in life. No one who is both thoughtful and open-minded should be able to announce in public discussion that cannabis is safe uh, or without psychiatric adverse effect risk for vulnerable members of the population. These observations have a lot of important public health policy implications. For example, um, how to regulate sales of cannabis to minors um, in states where cannabis sales are legal. Probably it would be wise to more strongly um, 
mount public health campaigns to say that if someone has a family history of psychotic illness, that that individual would be um, at potentially significantly higher risk of having cannabis cause a later life diagnosis of schizophrenia. And as clinicians, it certainly suggests that we should um, be attentive to cannabis use amongst our patients and uh, attempt as best we can to help people to um, be aware of this risks and support them in efforts to curtail cannabis use because this does appear to be a modifiable risk factor which ultimately can reduce schizophrenia risk and most probably can improve outcomes amongst people who do have schizophrenia.